learned to play an instrument, learned a second language, applied to college, applied for a loan, started a business, started a blog, shared a picture, shared a moment. Turn your wish list into a checklist with Internet Essentials from Comcast. When you're connected, you're ready for anything. Hello, I'm Ivan Wiener, Executive Director of the Albuquerque Film and Music Experience. Welcome to AFMX 2020, the virtual edition. As COVID-19 impacted so many festivals around the world, we are very fortunate and happy to be able to present an incredible program, thanks to our sponsors and our volunteers. Because of them, we're able to continue our tradition of bringing together filmmakers, musicians, students, and an entire community to share stories and collaborate into the future. This year, we have 73 incredible film projects with filmmakers doing live Q&As after their screenings. We also have our intimate conversation series that we'll be offering for free through Facebook Live. Please go to our website, abqfilmx.com, get your tickets for all of the events, see where you need to go for the free ones, and share with all of your friends on social media. It's gonna be a week to remember. You can also make a small contribution through the ticketing pages for any of the events to the AFME Foundation. Finally, I'd like to thank our core team of staff members and volunteers who have worked so hard to bring the virtual experience to life. Kira, Ariella, Carly, Cindy, Shane, Sabrina, Barbara, Jerry, Sean, and Sam, this fest is for you. And it's for all of the volunteers who have contributed over the past eight years of AFMX. From all of us at the Albuquerque Film and Music Experience, thank you. Now, let's fest. Hello, everyone out there in the World Wide Web. Welcome to AFMX's Intimate Conversation with Brad Lamack. I'm Ron Weisberg, uh, the moderator today. And we have Brad Lamack here, an LA talent manager. Um, you've been a talent manager in LA for, for 38 years. Do, do we have to put a number? To, do we don't have to put a, a number to And I think, look, at, we ought to be upfront with people are watching us all across the planet. And the truth is, let's let them know that you're never this nice. <laughs> I mean, let's just break that mold. He's no, been teaching at Emerson <laughs> College for over 25 years. He's been teaching the new yeah. business of acting. He worked for Norman Lear, one of the biggest uh, TV producers in the history of mankind or the universe because mankind <laughs> made it TV. Hi, Brad. I'm happy How are to you? be here. I'm great. And I'm happy to, I'm honored to be invited. I'm happy to be asked. I'm thrilled at any opportunity that you and I get to spend some time together talking about the thing we have we share a passion for right which is this this industry the business of acting and and you know not just the business as we've known it but sort of the evolving industry in this you know sort of new normal in this covid landscape so um there's a lot to talk about that's you know that's great that's great you know this wonderful positive stuff happening for everybody and, I, and i'm really excited about that me too and so just a reminder for everyone we are live streaming this and so you are definitely invited to ask questions mm -hmm. at the end of this session um that we're we're going to go through a little intimate conversation but please ask us uh, post your questions there in the comments we'll get to them afterwards promise all right um, Brad has so much experience. You can ask him anything in the business at all, not just about the business of acting. Um, he's written several books. Why don't you, why don't you tell us about the, uh, the fact that you're an author as well? 
Well, it all started, it was probably in 2000 when I was, um, I, I had been teaching at the Emerson College Los Angeles Center since 1995, 1996. <clears throat> and some time in 1999, somebody came to me and said, hey, we have some actors coming out this summer. Do you think you could do something with them? And I said, sure, you know, I'll figure something out. <laughs> but I've had my talent management <clears throat> excuse me, an entertainment PR business since the early 1980s. So I've been actively immersed in this. So the trying to create a curriculum for actors, um, it was really a work in progress. And what came out of that was really an interesting eye-opening experience for me um, in the teaching realm, which is that great teachers are only offering suggestions and perspectives and gems of wisdom, hopefully, from the years of experience we have. But the magic that really happens, it happens with you guys. It's like, it's not anything that I'm saying, it's how you process what I'm saying and what you do with it, whether you agree with me or not. And so uh, my mission has been to get actors out of just focusing on the acting piece of it, but to think about and embrace all of the other components that make you the brand that you are. <clears throat> so out of that initial experience, um, it was like I had this light going, well, you know, I only have the ability to have so many students in a class at a time, but I think there's some messages here that might benefit uh, uh, others. Let's give this a shot. So that was how the first book, which was called The Business of Acting, Learn the Skills You Need to Build the Career You Want. That's how that came out. It has nothing to do with acting. It's about how do you embrace this business? How do you embrace your place in this business? And, and exactly what does that mean? Like, how, how do I be the head of my team, the CEO of my company? Um, and I was blown away by the response. Um, and I think an awakening that we need to get artists out of just the creative zone but also into the business zone. And a few years later, the next book came out called The New Business of Acting, uh, How to Build a Career in a Changing Landscape. And that was because the industry had just changed so tremendously that nothing that was true before applied. And thrilled, blown away by the response to that. And then there was a follow-up book to that a few years later. And then the latest book came out last uh, month, the middle of August. COVID has had such a tremendous impact on everybody, everywhere. Um, but when we focus in on the business of acting and what that, that has meant <clears throat> for, excuse me, I'm having water. <laughs> what that has meant, I say it's water, what that has meant for content creators and artists, it was really time for a whole new look at what we need to do to move forward to thrive and to get back on the career journey and start creating again. So that's what I'm talking a lot about these days to my students and, and, and to my clients. And it's very exciting because we're seeing stuff bubbling again. It's like Monday felt like pilot season in March all over again, because of course we lost out on that. So it's a really exciting time. And I choose to focus not on you know what we can't do anymore or what we gave up on or what we lost. There's so much more to embrace that is creating opportunity for people anywhere who want to be in this industry, that that's what I'm really excited about now. That's, so there's a long answer to a very short question. No, that's very inspiring because we're, we're, we're all feeling that lack of hope and direction. Mm -hmm. And I think you offer that to people in a real tangible way. Um, you know, you were doing this before all the COVID landscape shifted everything so drastically once again. So you are sort of, you have your, your hand on the pulse of how everything is shifting and changing. And so you added a whole COVID chapter to your latest book. Is that correct? I did. Yeah, it's a, it, is a, it is a supplement. And, you know, I, what it does is it addresses each of the chapters that are in the, in the book <clears throat> with how COVID has changed what you need to do in your approach and in moving forward and in getting, getting, back, on, getting back on track. But at the end of the day, the message, the ultimate message is, is still the same. It is not just about your talent. It is not just about creating art. The best actor 
never gets the job. The right actor gets the job. And so like when you book the job, I go, hey, the best actor and the right actor got the job. Like, <laughs> I love when that, well, it's true. I love when that happens. But I think it's part of understanding why when you go up for an audition for something and you don't get called in or you get called in and you don't get called back and you don't book it, it has really nothing to do with you. It's about chemistry it's a chemistry it's a science and a math problem right it's not an art problem it's it's how do i it's like baking i'm a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a dash of this and a dash of that and mix it all together and and, and does it now look like what we need it to look like so i'm trying to get actors out of the emotional response to what they don't get to do and further embrace what they get to do Every day, every day, writing, creating, you know, this, this, there are great stories that are going to come out of this time. And great stories have always come out of times of challenge, like great art, great music, great literature, great poetry. And, and everybody, all of you will have great stories to tell about these times and, and survival and adaptation. Yeah, and yeah we've talked a lot about them. Yeah. And I think that, you know, know, it's like, you know, we, we're all struggling so much right now. And what would you tell the people out there that are, you know, struggling with oppression and their artists as well. And they're in a situation where they're told not to make waves. And it's like something that's tangible and real that's happening to them. So this is a really tough time in many ways, right? When you look at where we are politically and where we are socially and where we are artistically, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot happening on the planet. And I think it's great to have passion for all of that. And I think we have a responsibility to stand up and do the right thing. What's the right thing for us, right? Maybe uh, you may be doing the different right thing, but it's the right thing for you, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't control how people receive your message but you absolutely can control the creation of that message. And I think it is so important. Everybody wants to feel heard. Everybody should have a voice in the conversation, whatever the conversation is, right? So uh, I, I think we have to look at how do we want to change the world? What do we want to say? What is in our experience that we want to express, that we feel good about expressing, that we have a passion about trying to move forward. Look, you know, there's, there's entertainment that's social issues, right? A passion of mine is performance for social change, how we use the media and drama and art and protest to move forward a political or social agenda. But we also just have comedy, right? Where it's just about creating and recreating situations where people can just sit back and laugh and have a good time. And we need that. We, we really, really need that. I do not minimize, not for one single second, the struggle that's happening around the world. People are struggling. People have felt and experienced great loss. And I have such a- a- empathy for that. And I think the only thing that I can say that I hope will be comforting in some way is to don't deny or diminish what you're feeling. Make notes, keep a journal, keep a diary, because those stories would be really helpful. Here's what I want to see. I like. I want to come to Albuquerque for a weekend festival that maybe I have to create, where we create storytellers from people who are used to telling stories and people who have never told stories before. And we give them 20 minutes and we put them on a stage and we say, tell your story about COVID. How's COVID changed your life? How are you better because of COVID? Yes, we know. What have you lost? What have you gained? How are you moving forward? Like I, That's really important to me is to, um, you can't move backward, right? But we certainly, certainly can, can move forward. And we're under such tremendous challenge with everything that's happening around us, right? I mean, I'm here in Los Angeles, like we've got fires over there and, and there's, there's, there's protest over there and there's political rallies over there. And, you know, it's, yeah, you could look at all that and go, oh my, you know, what, what how do we move forward for this? Um, but there's 
always a place for art in this. There has, there has to be a place for self-expression. And, and I just am, I want to encourage people to do that, whatever art means to you. Just, just do it and, and share with us how you feel. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And so, you know, speaking on moving forward, what are the breakdowns looking like? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the one I'm having today or the ones that are the casting, the casting uh, stuff, right? I would like to know about your current right. personal breakdown, but also the state of casting <laughs> that you're seeing <laughs> going out there across the you see, You see like worldwide breakdowns, right? I do. I do. So here's the great shift that's happening. Um, some of it started before COVID, the pandemic, um, and, and has nothing to do with the pandemic. Uh, but so much more of it has everything to do with the, with the pandemic. Um, we were seeing a shift in auditions, which, was, uh, which involved instead of bringing actors into the room, we would request self-tapes, right? And so we would submit that way. Well, now that's the only way you get to audition. And in many cases, that's the only way you get to get a call back. And that's the only way you get booked. But here's the great news that comes out of this is that in the time it used to take a casting director to see 10 actors walking into their offices, they can see 50 now on self tapes. And I will tell you that in the last week alone, the rate of auditions in my office for my clients is at, is increased to where it hasn't been in a really long time. Wow. And, and again, this is, it feels like it's pilot season and, Here's an interesting truth. A client yesterday uh, was asked to self-tape an audition for a pilot that I had did the submission on because I believed that the client was worthy of that audition. Um, but the truth is that his resume didn't really, he wasn't ready. You know, he didn't have the kind of credits that we would say you go feature, co-star, guest star to a pilot series regular, but the net is being cast really wide now. And that's great news for me because I have a clear understanding for my clients, what their potential is. I've seen the evidence. And so now to be able to put that evidence forward and have a casting director say, yeah, you know what? I can see five times, 10 times the number of actors now that I used to be able to see before. It's, in, it's absolutely incredible. And so that's great, great opportunity. It's also very validating for actors who, who don't get out as often as they should, right? You never hear an actor say, oh, you know, you give them an audition. You know, I've been out a lot this week. You take this one. I don't want to go on that one. You want to go out. You don't want to give up any opportunity. And so whenever we can create more opportunity that um, helps us prove to the world what we believe in our clients and what the clients, the actors believe in themselves, that's a huge, huge win, whether they book it or not, it, it, it reminds you you're on the right track. Yeah. We all need that. We all need to feel that we're on the right track. It's a feeling that makes us decide to keep pushing forward. Well, yeah, and let's not even use the word push, right? If you say pushing forward, it means there's a resistance, right? I'm pushing yeah. against a resistance. Nobody wants me to work, so I'm going to push harder. That's not it at all, and that's part of my message. My mm. message is you know, reframe what you define as success, right? Like when yeah. a client goes out on an audition, I am not invested in them booking the job. I am invested in them having a good time and leaving a positive impression on the casting director who will go on to cast a lot of other stuff than that one particular role. So I want the client to recognize where the wins are. Mm -hmm. I want every actor to understand and embrace what's important and let go of the stuff that they can't control, right? You can control the quality of your experience. You cannot control if you're going to get the job or not. So rather than, as you say, push against what you feel is the resistance, um, embrace the opportunities that come to you to prove what you're capable of doing. And then when that's over, go back to writing stories and creating content and putting them on YouTube and, and, and having a voice. Well, I was just about to ask you that. How important is it now more than ever to be a hyphenate? It is only important to be a hyphenate. It wasn't so long ago, right? All you had to be was a great actor. Let's, let's roll the clock back 100 years in Hollywood when there was the studio system. 
right? And so all you had to be is great, a great actor and you would be found and you would be discovered and you'd be signed to seven year contracts and you would work or not, but you would be paid every week. And that was a price to pay for that. I mean, they controlled your life. They controlled how you were seen. They controlled, you know, who you went out with, but it was your talent that sort of propelled that. You can't do that anymore. It's, it's not enough to be great at one thing. We have to be, all of us, whether you run a business or you're an actor building a career, mm-hmm. you cannot wait for somebody else to give you the opportunity to do what you love to do. That's where a lot of, you say, the pushing against happens is thinking that, well, this isn't going to happen unless somebody says, oh, come on, come on, you can do this. Green light, I'm going to let you do this. Mm-hmm. I don't have to let you do anything. You don't need anybody else to write, produce, create, upload, and ta-da, there you are on, on YouTube. And I think there's a great satisfaction in birthing that artistry. So um, I understand that there's a fear sometimes and, you know, well, all I want to do is act. I don't really know how to do. Well, you don't know what you don't know until you try to do it and you fail miserably. But I've never known an actor who's tried to embrace the rest of their artistic self and failed miserably. It's always a learning experience. And they always come away with something worth watching and look at Ron, the truth is when people, when we who represent talent are looking for new talent for our rosters, we're, we're, we're not looking for who's the great actor. We're looking for who's the great person, who's the artist, what, what is the multitude of things, what do they bring to the package beyond just the, I can memorize my line, I can find my mark, I can do my slate. You know, give us, give us everything that you love to do, you're passionate about doing, you know how to do, you're working on doing, right? So to get, to get you out of the mindset that it's just about what kind of an actor am I? Yeah, it's a little bit about that. But, you know, who, who are you? Who are you? Right. You know, it's, it's so funny. It's like, we know that too, as actors, but it's, it's so scary sometimes to, to put all of ourselves out there like that and, and show all of our cards and say, here's how you can use us and, right. and, and just rip open our chest and just be like, <laughs> here you go. But what makes that scary, right? It's, it's the vulnerability, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. And so of our art, because art is so yeah. personal, like it, like imagine telling someone, hey, let me tell you this poem that I, I wrote last night that I'm really passionate about. And, and you, you're like spilling your guts out like this is the truth. You yeah. know what I mean? But people aren't ready and you're afraid that people aren't ready. Well, it's not you know for you I mean? to judge if somebody's ready for your art, right? And your art doesn't yeah. have life until you share it with somebody else. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I think that you have to own what you create be proud of what you create and, and there are critics everywhere. Right. But there are also people that will applaud heartily. And I think that that was a big lesson for me, right? The first time I got a terrible review of a book or of a web interview or a, you know, sure. And I said, yeah. wait a minute, you know, I know where my truth is. I, you know, and I think that y- y- you need to, you need to do that. You know, there is no, it's, it's hard. liberating. It's liberating, isn't Very it? liberating, and I think it opens the doors for you to explore other stuff, right? I mean, it's, there, there's, there's no limit to, to any of this, particularly in this landscape. And if COVID teaches us anything, once it's taught us how to have our temperature scanned and wear masks and you know, figure out how to move forward in social distance, I think it's teaching us, I think we will come back with a, having refreshed the page on, okay, what could be the worst thing that comes out of it? Certainly not a pandemic, right? I mean, we're going through that and we're learning how to move forward. And in fact, we're all becoming teachers through this process, right? And, and helping others. And I, so I, again, I <clears throat> say that I think that this is, this is a really, really good time. And one other quick thing, you know, what we're seeing, how the industry is changing, we're seeing production hubs now happen all over the world not just LA, it's not just New York. Mm-hmm. It's not that you have to be in here in LA or you can be anywhere and have opportunities that didn't really exist before. And we can maybe sort of get into the economics of that later or, or, or not. But um, 
the overview for me is that this is stuff we need to talk about and we are. This is stuff for you to embrace and I hope that you will. Uh, but I think there's great opportunity ahead to do the stuff you want to do, dot, dot, dot. You may not make a lot of money doing it because of the economic challenges of our times, but money never stood in the way of creation. Right. Right. We're not doing, like, if you're going to do this, you're not doing this for money. You know, people well, many, some people are, some people yeah, aren't. I, I don't know. I, I, know, but I don't know how to help doing it for money. Go to business school first. You know what I mean? Well, even if you go to business school, I don't know how to help you earn any money. I don't know how to make you money. I know how to build a career. I know how to advise you and coach you and tell you what, from my perspective, you need to do to move this forward. Um, I, I, I'm not always right. I make huge, made huge mistakes, still do, learning process, but it's a shared perspective. There's no guarantee of the outcome. So rather than be invested in the outcome, you need to be invested in the process of making all of this happen. You know, it's this, what other industry do you work, 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 and not get paid unless something else happens, right? Yeah. But um, that's true of, of all art. That's true of the business of, the business of acting. Like if you were a bank teller, you know, and the manager came up to you, your bank and said, Oh, you know what? I'm not going to pay you this week. I know you put the time in, but I'm not going to pay you this week. You'd have a problem with that. Right. But so it's sort of the sacrifice price we pay for, for our art. But um, yeah, there's, don't look at, at the limitations. Right. And, and, and the economy will, survive the economy will thrive again the industry will reinvent itself things will change once there's box office again and people get butts in seats at movie theaters and and arenas and performance spaces but that's going to take a long time to shake down into dollars and cents so we have to be smart enough economically and emotionally to say what do i need to do to create my art and not be stressed about the rest of the stuff happening in the world and paying my rent well you've got to find a way to earn some money doing something else that is allowing you to do what you really want to do, right? It's just a work in progress. Absolutely. And, you know, you are teaching all this stuff too, right? You're coming to Albuquerque at some point soon to, to teach this. Well, I am. I love Albuquerque. And it has nothing to do with you. It has to, well, it has a little to do with you. There's such great spirit in New Mexico. And I have been, it's busy, right? So I don't have a lot of time to travel and I don't do these sort of, I don't do workshops and classes and so I'm not the guy who, who does that. I have my college classes, I have my clients, I have my business interests, you know, and I'm challenged and I'm happy and I'm thrilled about all of that. Um, but I love to talk to actors when I have the opportunity to, because I'm trying to like get them to move, move along. And then you guys, in, in, in Albuquerque gave me this platform, this opportunity, like what, two or three years ago, you know, you sort of said, well, you know, we hear you're difficult, but come to Albuquerque and let's try and do a class in the business of acting because we, we think we sort of believe you that actors need to know more than just how to act. And I went for a weekend, right? I mean, and people came and, and it, was, it was an incredible community. And it was an incredible conversation between actors, artists who are doing that, actors, artists who haven't been recognized, but who intend to do that. And the, a meeting of the minds about who you are, what you want to do and how you get there and how you make that happen. So I, it has been such a gift for me to be able to come back either in person or in the last year virtually and, and, do those sessions and challenge artists and actors to get up to speed for what you need to do to be able to work and have your career right now. So I, you know, I thank you so much for that. And what's the joy of, of now that we're remote. I mean, I'd rather be in the room with everybody. Right. But so it's broadened the platform for where people can be and still take the session. And I think we're, and we've won in November, which is I'm excited about, right? To end the year on a high note and get actors thinking about how do I assess my last year? How do I evaluate my year? 
where do I put these various things in place so that I am empowered to move forward when January 1st gets here? So oh, anyway, I think that's thank a, you for an that. amazing time to have an, a workshop on the business uh, of your acting career and right at the end of the year so that you are inspired moving forward um, when January hits <laughs> and you know, the, it's, it's, it's like things have to slowly come back to a new normal. But right. there's also, you know, how you evaluate it. So one of the greatest mistakes actors make, like at the end of the year, they'll look back and they'll say, well, you know, I did this student film and I did that and I did this and I did that, but I, you know, I didn't make any money. And so they'll think, well, it wasn't a good year because I didn't make any money from my art. I, I created and I got some experiences and I, you know, I produced, but it didn't get paid. And I do not want actors and artists to assess value or evaluate how the year was based on what they earned, right? I want you to look back and let's assess that based on added value, which is what did I get to do? How did I get better at what I do? How did I get better at something I never knew to do before? What credits did I, did I earn? Did I update my website? Did I have new photos? I mean, there's lots of ways to unpack that. Money is not, I mean, money is a huge issue, right? I mean, that's survival. But in this conversation, I don't want you to feel less as an actor or less as a successful actor because you didn't earn the money that you need to pay your bills every week or every month, right? I mean, that that will come. So let's evaluate it on what I achieved creatively. How did I grow as an artist this last year? Um, to me, that's really, that's the focus. Because yeah. if, you, if, you, if you're of the mindset where your value is only defined by dollars and cents, I don't know how to spin that disappointment. So, so I, I, I'm trying to just focus on the achievements that you alone are responsible and, and can call your own. So what do you think like the three biggest challenges are moving forward for all actors? Parents, spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, people who love you and care for you who don't know a thing about this industry that you intend to make your life's work in. They know what it means to see your name on the screen. Like, oh, that's very exciting. But they don't have a clue on how it got there, right? And so that's both literal and figurative because it's very difficult to, to seek, expect, and find that kind of support from people closest to you if they don't understand the industry and the complications of the industry in which you are carving out your career and your, and your life's work. So I think, you know, that's difficult. And I would say, as we're approaching sort of the holiday period, whatever that's going to look like, whether we're in person or remotely and people start asking you, you know, Hey, how you doing? Or how come you're not a star yet? Or, Hey, what's going on? is that you not find frustration and disappointment in, in the questions, but look at that as an opportunity to educate them. And, and, and a great thing, if you're able to gather with the people you love over the holidays, you, know, you, you are required now to bring your stuff, like bring your iPhone, bring your camera, bring your, bring your lav mic, bring everything you need to produce a self tape for an audition because your agent or manager or through your own self-submissions, these opportunities are gonna to come to you all the time. It may be Thanksgiving and it may be Boxing Day or it may be Christmas, but the business is trying to catch up and those requests will be coming out at all times. And what better way to show your family and the people who love you what it means to be a working actor or attempting to be a working actor in this industry than to let them see your process. You know, this is, what I have to do. This is my job application. And, and to me, that's, you know, you're chipping away a little bit at showing them that the end result isn't what is, is what you're focused on. You know, you're focused again on the process of getting to do what you love to do. Yeah. So that's my holiday. Like, yeah. You're teaching everybody to shift your perception of what you think your trajectory and your need is 
and shift it, you know, more internally and just to make your life a more satisfied life as an artist? Well, I want to shift your expectations as well. Right. And I want to shift yeah. your focus on what it means to be successful. Happy is a good place to start yeah. rather than name above title. Although that's always, that's always nice too. Right. But I think the whole world is in a shift, right? Everybody's gone through and is going through a shift in ideas um, expectations, um, acceptance, uh, transformation. I mean, it's happening everywhere, everywhere we go from big businesses to mom and pop stores. You know, I walk down the street. Uh, I'm, I'm actually sort of actually in Pasadena, California. I walk down Colorado Boulevard where the Rose Parade will not be this year for the first time in its history. And you see four lease, for sale stores. Clo I mean, this is a, you know, we have to acknowledge what's happening globally you know, it's happening in Pasadena and LA it's happening everywhere but mm -hmm. you know we, we want to try and find a, a, a way of how do we and how, how do we ourselves and how do we help other people kind of assess that and move and move forward for that and if anything your art won't suffer your art will thrive because the there's a there's a richness in those stories um, and lessons to be learned from those stories. And you mentioned Norman Lear, right? So when I came to Los Angeles in the early 80s and I went to work for TV producer Norman Lear, com comedy, sitcom was his thing. And there were in incredibly difficult issues that were talked about in All in the Family and Maude and the Jeffersons and Good Times and all of the shows he created but um, they were addressed where there was also humor in, there were sitcoms, right? So you could address issues and talk about stuff and still be entertaining in a, in a way. And I'm not saying there's nothing to laugh at now, certainly. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, I laugh in the face of all of this, um, but I want to have a perspective of trying to see it through a different lens, right? And, I mean, I, I know many people who are having great issue, great trauma, great struggle now. And, you know, if you know some of those people, sometimes the greatest thing that you can offer up is your ear to listen to them and, you know, sort yeah. of help them rethink what happens next. It's always, it's always so important to, to be a good listener for people and to have people in your life that are good listeners so you can just process things. And I think a lot of people out there, um, you know, we just got a, a question about this. We um, are wondering what if we're coming to acting later in the game in life or we're coming back after a career and we think it's, you know, we're, we're, it's too late or something. What do you say to that? I love that. I embrace that. That's the Betty White factor, right? She's like 97. And she has proven that you have an opportunity to do this forever, right? So I, and I work with older actors and I work with actors who are coming back to the business after having been at it or, or gone away from it and coming back. And, you know, I teach and work with new to the business actors. Um, I, look, and I look at casting breakdowns all day. There are roles for everybody. Right. And so it's not like I'm going to put a college senior in the role of a 70 year old. I'm not going to do that. The longer you live, the more you experience, the greater richness you bring to every single role that you're appropriate to play. So the key word here is like appropriate. Right. I want to if you're self submitting or if I'm submitting a client, I'm I'm submitting appropriately. And, and I love, love, love to see actors people who have lived some life, who have said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. Like, yes, you can. Look at what's on television, right? I mean, there's, most of the people you see who are working actors are not famous people. They're not names you know, but they're all kinds of people from all walks of life with huge range of diversity. And there are those roles to be played. And look at, let's sort of address this head on. You know, we are at a great time where, um, the real key word in capitals, italics, underline, bold, is diversity in programming. And that for the really first time, you know, we're on a path to having content produced and exhibited for us 
that more reflects who we who we all are, right? Um, in commercials, in television, in stage, and in in film. So that you have never done this before is of no relevance to me. Nobody is born with a union card. Nobody is born knowing how to do this, right? You can get training at every single point, any single point of your career. And in fact, working with older people, is it's a huge gift. They're seasoned, they're funny, they're, they've suffered, right? I mean, they've lived lives that are different than the lives that people in other age categories have not yet lived. And they do bring an incredible range to roles. So again, a long answer to a short question. I love when people are passionate about this. They want to do this work. They have something to express, right? And so it's not for me or anybody else to say, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. No, it's not heart transplantation, right? That if you're 90, you, maybe you shouldn't be, not the patient, but the doctor. I mean, create, create, create all, all the time. God, what an incredible gift that you would have as an older person to create art and tell your story to your family, to your friends, to people you don't yet know. I love that. Yeah. And so what are you working on? Speaking of creating your own art, are you, can you talk about anything that you are working on, good it sir? It was a dark and stormy sir? night. <laughs> <laughs> I signed an NDA. I'm not allowed to even talk to you, but I broke it in my desire to have a conversation with you. Um, I am working on a, I'm writing a one woman play that has been a passion project of mine uh, for many, many years. Um, I'm from Boston. I was um, home visiting my mother about five years ago. I'm sitting at the kitchen table having some coffee and she came over and she dropped a manila envelope onto the table and she said, do you want this? through this and I'm opening, I said, what is this? What is this? And, and out poured a collection of about 50 letters that had been mailed from her uncle in Eastern Europe about 1910, 1920, written to his sister who had immigrated to New England about whether he should come to America, what life was like where he was, what was happening politically, what was happening socially. And, and, and the play that I'm writing is from the perspective of his sister, the woman in New England, who is receiving and reading these letters. And we see how she responds and we see how she reacts. Um, there's great, and they're mostly written in Yiddish. So the process of translating those, not just translating words, but, but, but translating and, and understanding the heart and the emotion behind it. Um, is huge. And I think, you know, while those letters were written in 1910, 1920, you'd be amazed at how much speaks to now. So that's really um, important to me is to be able, that's my art, right? I want to be able to tell, uh, to be able to tell that story. So that's, no, what, that's, that's incredibly powerful. You know, just the notion of receiving these old letters from an old ancestor is like, Fill, fills me with some emotion, you know, yeah. that I can't really describe. Just that that feeling, uh, that ancient feeling. Um, so I I can't wait to see that. That sounds. It's connecting. The, it's connecting the dots, isn't it? Because what happened to them is in my past. It reflects who I am and where I'm going and who I will be. Right? We're all connected in in one way or another. And you know, there's no generation that hasn't experienced its struggles. And when you think of what was happening globally, politically, socially, um, there was some pretty awful stuff happening during that time. And yeah. um, it's important. And I, I think, you know, the message for me, why those people are long deceased, how wonderful it would be to sit down and have had the opportunity to talk to them. You know, if you're a young person and you have grandparents or your parents and you don't know their story, their, their journey, how wonderful it would be to sit down and say, who are you? What, how, how, how did you become this person? Why did you make the choices you made? What was, what was behind why you went left instead of going right, right? And so 
So the more we know about who we are, where we come from, the more layers, the more richness, it's the color to the play by play for everything that we do, right? Whether we're working in Starbucks or whether we're writing our story for a one person show. Yeah. You, you know, it's not you, about the lines, you right? You touch on something so else. important. Yeah. You touch on something so important that, it, that we have to discover all the details of ourselves, good and bad. Yeah. And so, you and know, here's a real- In our history, in our family's history right. and everything that occurred, we just need to discover all the details and then it, the path forward will become so much clearer. Right, right. You know, where did, where did we come from? Everybody is from someplace, right? Everybody has a story. And, you know, once these people are gone, the stories are gone with them. And how sad it would be to let history die. So ask Ask the questions. You know, one of the great things that I love about, that I love that's happened during the last eight months is that many of us have gotten off of these devices and we're actually talking to each other. And, you know, we're, we're and I said this, I think back in March or April, um, I started writing about COVID for a column I write in backstage and I started to and that was sort of the germ for what became the, the book supplement last month. I said, you know, this is a time where we are together more so than we probably have ever been in a generation. Put your phones away. Stop talking, stop texting, stop emailing, talk. S -s sit at a table and have a meal together. Have a cup of coffee. Just sit and talk. Get to reacquainted with the people you thought you knew, right? It's so easy for us to rather than return a call or pick up the phone or, you know, I'm going to text. No, yes, no, you know, whatever it happens to be. So it's over. Let's not try and shorten that time. Let's em embrace that connection time. And I'm going to just give you a quick little aside for actors. For me, all of this has to do with, particularly when you are starting and building your career, like let's say you go for a small role, one line, two lines, three lines, right? So you'll have a lot of actors who say, well, I just got to memorize the lines and I got to walk in and I got to say the lines. And that's the worst thing you can do. It's not about the words you're saying. It's about who is this character? What, what, what is happening? That You have to build a life for every single character you play, whether it's five lines, it's a lead, if it's no lines, if it's, a, if it's an atmosphere person, everybody has a life. They're not characters. I mean, they're real people. And, and I think the more we get in touch with why, understanding why that that's important, that becomes the greater art. So I, I'm trying to push that forward. Oh, that's great. You know, I think one of the biggest questions, going back to the, the New Mexico scene yeah. and what's going on in the minds and hearts of the New Mexico actor, I think the New Mexico actor really wants to know from you should I move to LA? Should I get all my crap, put it in storage, get a van, move to LA, grind out, don't do live in the beach <laughs> by the beach in Venice in my car? No, you're talking about you. Please don't come run. Please don't come. Um, here's what happened, right? So there's been this idea based on some evidence that existed at the time, that if you really wanted a professional career in the business of acting, um, you had to go to <clears throat> New York, you had to go to Los Angeles, you could go to Chicago, you could go to London, you could go to Sydney, you could go, I mean, there are places where there are industries, right? Um, but this shift was happening before COVID. And so, so some of that applies, but most of it doesn't anymore. And, and so re rewind it back just a little bit before COVID, you know, local production hubs were happening all over the planet. And that's because local governments were recognizing that by crafting tax incentives for production companies, they could lure business away from shooting in, at home bases in LA and New York and other places and bring them to Albuquerque and bring them to Shreveport and bring them to Pittsburgh and bring them to all of these other places because it would be less costly for them to shoot there. But the deal was also rooted in, when you come here, you have to hire local people to work in your production. 
local actors, local, whatever the deal structure was, right? Including production people. So this began a mind shift that yes, some roles in these projects were being cast from the major hubs, but a lot of stuff was being cast locally. And so we were seeing a trend, a real big trend to for all of this happening, which was great because it gave local actors exposure, right? And so what we're seeing now is budgets are becoming so tight because there just hasn't been an influx of box office cash and other revenue is, you know, how do we get creative with this? Well, we get creative with this by doing local hire instead of hiring an actor in LA and flying that person into the location and putting them up and, and paying them a per diem on top of their, their rate to work. We just hire somebody local. It's cheaper for us. It's many times as good or if not better an actor. Um, and it, it just levels the playing field a little bit. And I, I, I host this, um, YouTube series called Inside the Business of Acting, right? We're doing a COVID series now where I'm talking to industry leaders about the impact of COVID on um, the industry. And, and many, a casting director and one studio casting executive has said to me in, that, in those conversations, they love the opportunity to cast a wide net, right? So that you can self-tape an audition and send it in from anywhere. And we'll talk about how to get you to the location when you book the job. But in the meantime, since we're not invested in your booking the job, we're invested in the exposure. It's, it's giving casting directors an opportunity to know actors they would never otherwise have a chance to know because they weren't in a major LA or New York hub. And it's giving actors an opportunity to be seen without having to go through all of that that you've just explained. So I think it's ramped up the responsibility of actors to do stuff beyond just look at the self-submission casting services. You have to start doing research. You have to start knowing what's being produced, where it's being produced, and who's responsible for those productions, and start getting proactive about your outreach to get your potential exposed to the people who are those decision makers. Another long answer to a very short No, question. that is such a good answer. I think that, you know, I think nobody is really doing that. Like, it's easier said than done to really go after it in such an immense way. But the, the detail work that you're talking about is looking, like, through every, every magazine about the industry and seeing what projects are being done and looking the casting directors up and sending, a, you know, figuring out how to get, a, get them your stuff. And, like, you got to do so much yeah. legwork. Right. And so why, why wouldn't you, if you were in any other industry, you'd want to know what makes it tick, right? You have an obligation and a responsibility to know how this industry was built and who the players were in building this industry and in doing that research. And so you go to inside the business of acting on my YouTube thing, my YouTube uh, series, and you watch my interview with Amanda Richards, who's head of casting and talent at Sony Pictures Television, and you watch the interview with casting director Paul Ruddy, who does film television commercials, and you hear them say what I'm just saying to you, and they say, oh, gee, that's pretty empowering. I like what they just said. So you go on IMDb, and if you do not already have your own IMDb Pro account, Find a way to fund that because it gives you access to information. Look them up. There's their information. There's their phone. There's their email. Send them an email. Go, hey, Amanda, I just watched your interview with Brad Lamack. And I was thrilled to hear that, you know, you are now open in this new landscape for seeing actors from all these different places for consideration for projects. How do I do that with you? Yeah. Right. That's to amazing. me, that's, that's what we, we can do. That's that the work, now. right? That's it's, the work. And so Ron, how many yeah. times have we talked about the, the, the biggest frustration for me is not seeing, I see passion all the time. What I see too often is actors who only want the result. They don't want to do the work. And so yeah. what I'm saying now is that's part of the shift. That's yeah. the hugest part of the shift is do the work. And it's easier to do the work and find this information now than it has ever, ever, ever been. Yeah. 
I think uh, one of the things that actors everywhere struggle with is this idea of social media. And and you and I have talked in the past about, yes. should we do a, a workshop about social media and like things to post and what not to post? Because, uh -huh. you know, I personally hate social media and, you know, posting stuff and like, hey, look at me. I just, mm -hmm. it's very self-deprecating. And, and so what is your advice for actors out there? have a whole chapter in my book about this because it has come up time and time and time again how wonderful social media is at connecting us with people we would never want anything to do with before right it's like oh my god i have 11 million friends i don't know how i know them but we're connected it's like a numbers game right like oh i have two million friends well i have three million followers well i have two billion you know it's it, it almost introduces a, a, a competitiveness to that, right? And so it's not the range of the exposure, it's the quality of the exposure. It's all about demographics and audience. You want an audience that's invested in you and connected to you and keeps coming back to you. And, and, and it's not mass communication. And uh, you know the danger is not in having the platform Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, Instagram, all of those other things that I can't pronounce. It's, it's not about having it. The, the challenge is how do you use it, right? And so the danger in these charged times in which we live by that, you know, mostly politically charged times where people are on, they're on one side or the other. It's very rare that you see somebody in the middle and you see so many people expressing how they feel. Um, on their social media pages, and we have the right of freedom of speech, so we're allowed to say whatever we want, but there's also a consequence with not having that right, but how you package that message, right? So the whole adage is, remember the old, you know, you're not allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater, right? That's not free speech, but if you go to the person next to you going, I smell smoke, pass it on, like that's a different way to do it. But you run the risk when you look at this from a performance for social change agenda in that when you express how you feel about a hot issue or a candidate, you will have the people who also agree with you go, yeah, 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 perfect, perfect. But you ha will equally run the risk of the people who now know how you feel and now know that they disagree with you completely go the other way. And so, you know, over the, this is nothing new before social media, right? This is nothing new for decades. I've had clients be involved with being, using their, their fame or the spotlight shines on them to help draw attention to a nonprofit organization, a political candidate, a social issue that they were passionate about. But you have to be very careful. Uh, oftentimes I'm finding myself when those opportunities come up I'm saying to the client, let's think about the risks and the rewards of your speaking out. And so that also applies to you and you and you and you and you and me and you and anybody with a social media account, right? You don't need a publicist to gain access, right? You can get your message out. You don't have to hire somebody to help you do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So you have the platform, you have your 11 billion followers. And so you respond to something that has nothing to do with your professional brand or what you're trying to achieve with your social media presence professionally. And suddenly it's become a space for, you know, the personal back and forth, back and forth. Well, I think, or you think, and you know, so many people have stopped talking to each other and unfriended and you know, you lose relationships. So it's not the platform on which to have those conversations. I love nothing more than having coffee when we can get back into Starbucks and, and chat with people who, feel differently about things than I do. What a learning experience that is. I know this is how you feel, but you know, why? Let's talk about it, right? And you don't have that opportunity easily enough to do that on social media. So it's a much bigger answer than, than you know, the question of how do we manage social media? I think you have to think about what is the purpose? What is the desire, the design, the intent of your social media presence? If it's for you to post pictures about family and talk about your life and things that matter to you, that's very different than using your social media presence to build an awareness for who you are as a professional 
in whatever industry you're in, it's a you you don't want to run the risk of somebody getting turned off to your art just because you feel differently about something that pushes their buttons about. Um, and and I think it's a it's a fascinating conversation. So am I saying, yeah, you know what? It, sometimes it's best not to say anything. Yeah, if it means it's, I'm, that if somebody knows you feel this way, they're not going to buy your, your, your album or you know, they're not going to go buy a ticket to your movie. I mean, look at, look at the box office, that, the price that Mel Gibson paid for. Now everybody knows how he feels about a certain thing, right? So there's a, fall, there's a fallout from, from that. There's a fallout for the case of Woody Allen, right? Like, why should I, you know, now we know we shouldn't buy a ticket, you know, and, and you can't control all of it, but I think you can have smart conversation about it. And I think you make a decision about what, do I, what is my intent for my social media presence? How can I help it move my career forward? If I have a personal website from my business, let me not put anything that's opinion on it. Let me just have it be a newspaper online to promote my career. So it's a huge question now. And now that we've all been home for eight months with nothing to do but talk about how we feel about stuff because there's been so much going on, right? And, and what do we do with that? It's very easy to go online and you know cl click how you feel. But I think we just need an awareness of what, what might happen or what might we risk by doing that. Yeah. Well, here in a in a few minutes, we're going to jump on with a, um, some audience questions. Oh, wonderful! Great, great, great. I wanted you to sort of talk about your class at Soul Acting Studios coming up uh, November seventh and fourteenth. Well, if I can't be there in person, and and I'm hoping that next year we will be able to finally, I'll be able to get my self back to Albuquerque because I love being there and just the energy of being in person. So we're going to do a class coming up in November. It's two parts and it's on the Zoom platform. And it involves everything that's talked about in my book and in the COVID update and the shift in the landscape. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a really a personal coaching session for everyone in the group. And they come with all the questions they have. And I have my agenda of all the stuff that I need for them to know to kind of challenge how they look at their career and how they move that forward. And then we dive into this whole new landscape of, of really the importance of self tape auditions and virtual live auditions, which is becoming huge now, right? I'm trying to teach them. It's not just an audition. It's a live television. So how do we prepare and package for that? So then I, I do some assigning, I assign some scenes for each, each student in my class is custom cast, given sides for a role that's really being done now. Uh, that is actually a role that they would be submitted to play. Uh, they are charged with doing their self tape in the week between the two classes. We get together for our second class. We watch each back. We talk about it. I take them through a deconstruct and unpacking of everything that went into the audition from way, the way it looks on camera and what all that stuff is in the background that's distracting me from looking at you, know, you and focusing on your audition uh, to the quality and the essence of the character. And then I give them a live callback. Mm. Same scene, virtual live as it would be in an actual situation. And you know, we talk about how do you get comfortable doing that and, and, and we'll do it and do it until we get it right. And so my goal is that you know, the end of the two classes, people come away going, yeah, you know, I understand what I need to be doing differently or I am further empowered because I've discovered that what I am doing is really what I should be doing. Um, so it's just an open opportunity to talk about this stuff and to get it right to get everything right that has, you know, it's, it's not about, am I good at this? If you have enough passion, you will become good at it eventually, right? You need the acting training. You need the systems, the methods, the techniques. You need to know that stuff. But you also need to know how that, where that applies and where it has nothing to do with pursuing a career. So that's what we're doing in November. So I'm really excited about it. 
and uh, and I hope people will check it check it out if they're yeah you know, no I think that's great you know because it speaks to a, a question that um, Kira Sippler has uh, for someone who's changing careers what advice do you have uh, to get into the acting community well um, the first piece of advice would be <clears throat> in changing your career change gradually transition from where you are to where you want to be. Um, if, uh, you know, I immediately I was thinking about somebody who was walking away from a job that they don't like in a career or an industry they don't want to be in going, I'm out of here. And then you find yourself with no income and no, no fun, none of the funds available that you need for the tools you have to build and buy and create and use and maintain to have the career. So my advice on that is gradually, gradually understand there will be financial challenges. Understand that in the beginning as a non-union actor, non-union work doesn't pay very much. And the truth is even as a union actor, these new contracts that the union has embraced, created and embraced are paying actors less than ever before. And so understand globally, not just transition from, I don't wanna do this anymore and I wanna do this now, but you know, how do you connect those dots emotionally, fiscally? Plan, plan for it, right? I'm very big on action plans, creating an action plan. You set the end goal, what do I want to achieve? Then you back into it by writing down the steps that you need to implement in order to achieve that goal. I think you need a map. I think you need a guidebook for something as important as leaving one career, one job, one phase of life and into another. I think you need Wait, to- don't, do you, don't you guide and map things for people? Uh, Columbus, kind of came, Columbus came to me to map, and look how that worked out. He was huh. going there and I, yeah. I mean, I don't do any of the mapping. I help you You're map. like, oy vey, oy vey, Columbus, right. go this way, go right. this way. Right, left, right, up. It was a dark and stormy night, however, um, it's my job to ask the questions that help you create the plan, right? And so you need to know how, really how you feel about A, B, C, D, E. Like, how do you, you can't just make a life change by, you know, I'm going to change my tie and put on a t-shirt. I'm going to, you know, it's in a way it's sort of figuratively about that, but I think it has to be very deliberate and I think it has to be over time and it has to be, um, handled with a huge amount of patience and tremendous managing of expectations. You know, my question would be, well, I get you want, this is great. You want to transition careers and do this, but what, what, what do you see and what do you want to be different here than there? Right. So it's not just easy saying I'm out of here. I'm doing this now. I mean, that's, I don't want, I don't want to, don't set up a, a you know, a path for, frustration and, and failure because you don't understand the steps you need to take. I think it's great. Anybody who wants to do art, love it, love it. Just approach it as a business person first, creative person next. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of people that are uh, wondering how, you, you know, what your advice is on staying motivated and networking and building a community. Very difficult to build a community and stay connected when we can't get together, right? But there are other things that we can do, like connect on Zoom and other online platforms. Um, we have seen a proliferation of classes that have moved online, like all levels of professional classes. If you are a SAG-AFTRA member, there is almost every day an online seminar, workshop, Q&A screening that you can avail yourself mm -hmm. of. And I think the great news is that, you know, no matter where you happen to live right now, your community has become global, right? It's not that, you know, well, I'm here in Albuquerque, so I just can take a class in Albuquerque. You can take classes anywhere. And everywhere, right? So that's about research and finding out who you might want to learn from, connect mm -hmm. with. You know, we're all, it's like Amanda at Richards at Sony casting says, you know, there, we don't know who we don't yet know, right? And so we want to meet you as much as 
I think there are people who want to connect with people like me who do, do this for a living. And sometimes the greatest result of a connection is not an email that says, will you represent me? It, it's about making the connection, you know, who are you? What can I learn from you? Make me aware of who you are. You know, that, that sort of thing. It's not just seeking the end result. I mean, it's in, in building the relationship. We've forgotten that relationship is the most important thing. Family, community, friends, pr profession, right? We all want to work with people we like being with. Yeah. And that's why to me, I, come full circle to the the audition. I don't care if you get the job. I care about the relationship you start to build with the person on the other end. It gets you greater access and starts to create some something beyond just the, what the result of one job would bring. I that's, love the question. That's perfect because, you know, as an acting coach, I, I try to always emphasize to the students that this is about a relationship. Everything is it about a relationship event, what's happening between the people in this moment, nothing else really matters. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And look at, go to my website, it's thebusinessofacting.com, you know, learn, read, explore, check out the resources. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to help actors be better at everything except acting, I leave that to them. I can't teach you how to be a great actor, but I can talk to you and have you start to think about the box in which that career happens. And especially, well, especially now in this new environment. We've, we've argued about this before, but what you do makes people better actors because it de-stresses them and takes the pressure off of them and get their new perspective, the shift in, in their, their, their expectation. It really does make people better actors. Well, thank you for saying that. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but my goal is, and I think that you are a better actor, the more confident a person you are, the yep. more in control, the more understanding, the more in control you have, the more understanding you have, um, the more awareness you have of your place in the, mm -hmm. in the greater picture, right? And the more you recognize that you don't need anyone to create to give you the opportunity to create, you can create on your own, right? If you're waiting for validation for somebody else to tell you you're wonderful, um, that that's a problem because if you're really good, chances are you're going to push the buttons of somebody who wishes they were as good as you and will not say you're wonderful because you know I don't want to admit that I'm not so good. But I thank you for saying what you said. I. Um, I think a confident actor is an attractive person. A confident actor is an actor willing to take risks, safe risks, risks in terms of new material and stretching a little bit. Um, and really, Ron, the truth is that there's a thirst for content now, right? That's been the result of, of COVID is that we've all been such huge consumers of entertainment content that we've drained that. And so producers and networks and Netflix and Amazon Prime, and you're, they're, they're looking for new content to be able to serve up to all of us. So, you know, d d just tell your stories and learn how to connect because, you know, we're eager to connect with you too. Yeah. So speaking of learning, uh, you know, Jenny Kinsey, she has a question of like, how important is it to go through a specific degree program, you know, like an MFA? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Jenny. <laughs> All right. So here's where I get myself into a lot of trouble as a college professor now for 26 years and with somebody with a couple of degrees myself. Yeah. I think that college and university education is an incredible gift to purchase for yourself because it gives you a place to grow up, a community to develop, things to explore, to get to know yourself, to consider new ideas and to stretch. Um, however, you will not be a better actor or a more successful actor because you have an MFA or because you went to this school as opposed to this school, right? That's, that's not 
the investment of, of higher ed, right? So I, I love higher ed. I embrace it because of the community and the experience and, and the growth that both teacher and student can experience together. But you have to recognize that the, the business of higher education is about tuition and grades and loans and grade point averages. The challenges that colleges and universities are not graduating students, particularly actors on how to get a job and how to be employable, right? And so I'm on my little mission trying wherever I can chisel that away to teach actors how to, how to do that. I think you have to go to college. I think, I think it's a great safe space to meet people not like you and to ex just explore and experience. And I, I, I embrace it completely, but do not think that your education stops the day you graduate. Really your professional training begins the day you graduate. And so um, I, I struggle with my answer to this and this is not new. This is th almost 30 years worth because I see students come into my classes. I see what happens during the semester. I see how they leave. I see what they do after they leave us, right? And so that responsibility is not on the university or the college. That responsibility is on the student, right? It's on the responsibility of the student to connect the dots. And it is, and should be our, I make it my responsibility. I want to teach students how to apply what they're learning academically to the real world, right? That's what makes you employable. Not that you were the star in all the state, the plays at school, or not that everybody told you you were wonderful. You know, how does that translate into what you need to seek and have and build a real career aside from that? So I've contradicted myself many, many times, but I'm, I'm conflicted on the answer because it's all good, but I have my, hmm, I want you to look at it this way approach as well. But thank you for the question. Yeah, I think, you know, basically what you're saying is it depends on you and how you experience that kind of environment and what you take away from it. And if you're able to do that in other ways as well, um, there's not just one way to skin a cat, maybe. Well, as a vegan, I don't know if I would use that particular expression. To, to scale a fish <laughs> or that uh, to, to to turn a lamb no to maybe maybe peel a carrot would to be chop great. a broccoli right right okay. right 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 um yeah i mean traditionally higher education for those who have been able to um get it and and put themselves in that situation um it's as much about what happens to you in your personal growth during that time as it is about your learning the specific components of the degree that you are seeking you know mm -hmm. in a global sense sure i mean um, income is rooted in education right education is the is is the great um lifter it's the great great opening of doors to opportunity Right. And so, but a lot of that has to do again with how, how you change and evolve and what you learn and how you feel differently and w what you're magnified with, you know, it's about a lot of things other than what grade did I get in science? Right. And so to me, that's the value of that education. Yeah. And I think it, you know, it always depends and every program is different. You have to look into who those people are in those specific programs because they might have, you know, somebody extremely uh, knowledgeable that you would learn way more from in that one program. It's not because of the institution. It's because of that individual. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at I, there's not a week that goes by that I haven't heard from, talked with uh, when we can get together, seen and had coffee with a handful of students who've been in my classes over almost 30 years. I, I'm so joyous that they stay connected. I'm so proud of what they're achieving. And you know, a lot of them end up not being in the business of acting or they're not acting or they're doing something connected to, but not actually, or they've done something completely different and how wonderful that is, right? So the opportunity to discover your passion or a new passion 
or to, you know, have an aha moment about something you thought you really wanted to do with your life that maybe not so much now that I see how it really works, right? That's, um, that's very power. It's very powerful. So, um, yeah, I embrace speaking, that. Speaking of aha moments, people want to know what gave you the aha moment to be like, hey, I'm going to be a talent manager. So here's what happened. I discovered from my work at Universal Studios for Norman Lear, two really critical things for my personal and professional development. Uh, two, there were two aha moments. Um, the first aha moment was I love working with talent. I loved being on those sets every day. I loved the relationships I was carving out and creating and friendships developing with the actors who were on the shows I was working on. I also discovered that I was a terrible employee, mm -hmm. that I wasn't at my best working for somebody else. Now I have to be careful that this doesn't come off sounding the wrong way. Um, it's not that I had an issue with authority. <laughs> It's just that I always kind of had a different take on how it should be done. Mm -hmm. And when I had an opportunity to say, give me an opportunity to show you that why I think this will work, it did in some interesting ways. And I was able to kind of change the equation. And when the opportunity came for me to say, you know, this was good. This is like my college education. This is like graduate school. I learned so much. I went from working in broadcasting in Boston to working on a, on a motion picture studio TV lot with all of the joy that goes on and the create creativity that goes on around that. And I got to see how that process of creation works. And I got to see how it impacted people. And I got to see the great rewards and the great disappointments and the great challenges. So that was an eye opening. That was aha for me is that I wanted the opportunity to work with the people I wanted to work with. I wanted the opportunity to be my own boss. I wanted the opportunity to either do really well and feel good about that or to fail miserably and, you know, crawl back to Boston and do TV news again. So, mm -hmm. You know, and it's not just that you have those moments once, right? It's just my mid twenties when that happens, I sort of kind of have aha moments all the time, right? And isn't that about staying relevant and staying connected? And you know, what do you want to, what might you want to do next? So I think that it is a great, scary gift to be able to say, you know what? Nobody has created the platform that I want to, the playground on which I want to play. So I will try and create something that's a little bit different, that's not radical, that provides a service, that allows me to do what I do and build my brand doing it. And you know, I've made a couple of good decisions and a lot of terrible decisions along the way. And uh, I'm a work in progress. I'd like to share, you know, it's about sharing stuff that I find that works with other people. I've never been asked that question before. Thank you for that. No problem. And what were your biggest challenges as a talent manager over the years? That I knew nothing about the business. You know, I was, uh, before I, I, I initially started my company as an entertainment PR company, but I quickly found myself guiding and mentoring and advising and coaching my clients on career stuff a lot. And I was at lunch with a friend who happened to have been a talent manager. I didn't really quite understand what that was. Uh, and he said, you know, how's things going? I said, oh, great. You know, we're, we're doing this show and that publicity and that magazine. And I've talked to the, this client and I'm getting them this audition. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, that that you're doing about getting them work um, that and coaching, that's called management. That's talent management that's different from PR and publicity. I said, really? Really? He said, yeah. yeah. And you know, you can get paid separately 
for that. Well, then that I had a great wit. Help me sort of say, oh, tell me more about that. <laughs> right, light dawned on marble head, right? So I, I began developing an, a, a real awareness that what I was doing had value beyond just what I thought I was doing. And that I didn't know if I was good at it, but I loved doing that work. And so I went to all my clients and I said, hey, you know how you're paying for PR services every month and we're having so much fun and how I'm, well, now I'm your manager also and you're gonna pay me extra for that and we're gonna build. And every single person I went to and, and told, and asked them, I told them, uh, we laughed a lot and then I said, yeah, I'm serious, really, I'm serious. And they came and I, I, I'm incredibly, mm, uh, reflective and joyous and um, happy about those people that put their trust in a then 26, 27 year old to do work for them that I just think I I did what I did instinctively because I didn't know that's what it was, which is why I look like this at 27, right? It's all of that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, real quick, uh, we have a specific question yes. from, from Jill he, uh, Gigi Heese, and what, how do we describe and differentiate the difference between a manager and an agent? And I know you've explained this a thousand times. Yeah, it's my favorite question. It is my favorite question. Thank you for giving me a chance to say that. Agents focus on jobs, managers focus on careers. Agents are like telemarketers of talent. Their goal every day is to submit get auditions for and book as many jobs for as many of their clients as they can for which they get 10% commission when the client does the job. Managers are focused on the global picture of a client's career. Um, you would have a different agent for film and television than you would for commercials, than you would for writing if you were a, a, a writer or, or music or literary. The manager is one person who oversees everything from uh, what you get paid for stuff, for saying, no, that's not enough, for saying, we'll do it for less because the role is important. I I'm not invested. I think managers are not invested in what you're paid. We're invested in the opportunity you get and what added value we get when you get to do that. So um, it's all about managers being immersed in your, in your life and, and really helping to guide. There's a huge trust, huge trust factor there to guide you and advise you and, and, and steer you clear and manage the schedule. And there's as much challenge in managing a successful known person as there is in someone who's not yet there, right? There are different challenges, but um, in short, agents, jobs, 10%, managers, careers, 15%, although we should get 80, but 15%. Um, I'm not a good salesperson. I could not be an agent. I, I cringe at the, at the idea that I would have to sell something to somebody, but I'm passionate about my clients. I can talk about what they ought to be doing because that in my core matters to me, which is why, you know, we actors find the people that's supposed to rep, that are, they're supposed to be represented by. Like we find, we find each other. It's, you know, sort of like swipe left swipe, you know, you kind of, get where you're supposed to be. And it's, it's an, it's a, at times exhausting, but incredibly just exhilarating relationship when you have a really balanced manager client relationship and you experience such great growth, you know, how wonderful to deliver to a client what they came to you for, or to see your client get the Emmy award or to see your client get the star on the walk of fame and know what it took to make that happen. That's Amen. joyous to me. That's, you can't, that's not about money. Amen. Thank you so much, Brad. It's Thank so you so great. much for the opportunity to talk about stuff we don't always get to talk about. And, and I just, I, I, I wish everyone to be well and to be yeah. safe and mostly, mostly, mostly stay positive. Stay yeah. positive. 
we're moving forward. And, and I, you know, for those people out there wondering about how you find community and, and togetherness, you know, take classes, do, you know, AFMX is an example. You're here now. This is community. We are connecting, right? Go to these online film festivals, you know, get into writing groups. You know, you have to be proactive. You have to connect and reach out to people. Wow. All right. So, Thank you to all of the sponsors. Thank you so, so much. Everybody go check out all the sponsors for AFMX. Um, Brad Lamack, talent manager, extraordinaire, powerhouse. You are the man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Be well, everybody. Thank Bye, y'all.